So this is a presentation on pediatric hydradenitis suppurativa. These are my disclosures. Part of this research that I'm going to be presenting today was funded by an Abbey grant. So what I intend to uh, go over is the diagnosis of pediatric hydradenitis suppurativa. We're going to talk about what this condition is. I'm going to share with you data of a retrospective multicenter study on pediatric hydradenitis suppurativa. And we're going to also review part of the management and some of the associations that we see in kids that present this skin disorder. So what is hydradenitis suppurativa? So we know that this is a chronic inflammatory skin disease. So it kind of walks and wanes, it comes and goes, and inflammation in the skin presents as recurrent boil-like lesions. Sometimes people call this acne inversa because it presents in the folds, and sometimes it can look like acne. Uh, patients can present with pimple-like lesions, they can have a pus-like discharge, and in more severe cases, this can lead to wounds, sinuses, and ultimately heal, leaving scars behind. The most common areas affected are uh, the axillae growing under the breast and abdominal folds. And although it has pus and sometimes it can look like infection, it is important to know that this is not an infection. So what do we know about pediatric hydradenitis suppurativa? So we do know that it is hard to recognize. And because of this, sometimes it is underdiagnosed. It has not been well studied. And there is a lack of best practice guidelines specific to pediatric patients. And lastly, it is difficult to treat. So when do we see uh, HS presenting? So it is more commonly seen in the early 20s, between the ages of 20 and 24. Newer uh, information that was published recently last year um, showed that there are two peaks of presentation. It presents the first peak in the late teens and the second peak presents in the mid forties. Um, the age of diagnosis is a little bit different between males and females with uh, earlier presentation in women. And what about children? So we know that it is more commonly seen after puberty. Uh, so it affects mostly teenagers, but it can also be seen in younger kids. So we always need to suspect this diagnosis. A big report of many patients with hydradenitis suppurativa showed that about 7% of those patients started presenting the disease before the age of 13, and about 2% started presenting it before the age of 11. And in the literature, the youngest patient that has been reported to have this condition was one uh, year, seven months old. So how often does uh, hydrogen suprotiva present? So it is difficult to tell because many times this is misdiagnosed and there's a delay in diagnosis. Uh, but a um, recent report in 2018 showed that there was a prevalence of about 0.8% across all age groups in, West, in the Western population. So prevalence, prevalence refers to the number of cases of a disease that are present in a particular population at a given time. So um, this is probably the most accurate data we have so far of how, um, of the prevalence of HS. And how often does it happen in children? So in children, it is less common. Um, it has been reported that the prevalence is of 0.028% or 28 kids per 100,000. Uh, and we do know that there is a standard, standardized prevalence that is higher in girls, in patients between the ages of 15 and 17, and in African Americans. So the highest prevalence was observed in, among, in female adolescents aged 15 to 17 who were African American. So why does it happen? And this is a question that we still don't know. Uh, there are many contributing factors like friction, abnormal response of the body to bacteria, occlusion of the hair follicles, these substances called pro-inflammatory cytokines that drive inflammation. Uh, there's also the rupture of the follicular wall leads to destruction of this apocrine glands that we have in our body. And this also contributes to 
uh, some of these lesions. And there's, there's a role of secondary bacterial infection that also drives this disease. So why does it happen in children? So there are some patients that present earlier, and these are patients that we sometimes find might have family history of other family members affected with HS. So genetic factors might play a role. There might be a genetic predisposition, and there are some forms of the disease that have been reported to be inherited. And we do know that there are risk factors to develop HS early in life. So if you, have, uh, if you are a female, if you have a positive family history of the disease, and if you have other things like acne, uh, dissecting cellulitis of the scalp, and penodial sinuses, then you're more likely to have HS earlier. And what does HS look like? And this is something that has not been well characterized. And this was the initial question that we had when we started this uh, research project several years back we realized that there was not a good description of HS in children. And to make this diagnosis, we really need to know what it looks like and to create awareness for physicians to be able to make this diagnosis early on. So we put um, our groups together and uh, we started doing a local retrospective chart review of our, our institution. Um, and through PEDRA, this became an, an international collaboration. Um, a few other centers uh, joined us, uh, one from Italy, one from Israel, and one from Australia. So this um, research that I'm going to present is an international collaboration that we were able to, uh, to report uh, through collaboration with PEDRA. It was published online in February of this year, and we are reporting 481 pediatric patients with hydradenitis suppurativa. So of this 481 patients, we did find that there was a female uh, predominance. About 80% of the patients were female. And in keeping with the literature, the ratio between females and males was four to one. One of the interesting things that we found is that the age um, at which patients started presenting symptoms was different than the age at diagnosis. So there was a disease duration of about two and a half years by the time um, that the diagnosis was made. Um, this gap between presentation and uh, diagnosis tells us that this is still something that is under-recognized. The patients were sent to dermatology, most commonly by pediatricians, and uh, about 40% of them had a referring diagnosis of HS. So if we think about this a little bit differently, 60% were sent to dermatology with another diagnosis, and the, uh, there was no suspicion of HS being the diagnosis in these patients. Okay, so we found as well that about 41% of patients had a first degree relative that was also affected with hydradenitis suppurativa. And 50% of uh, patients had at least one uh, first degree relative that had uh, also a comorbidity. The most common comorbidities in family members were hypertension, diabetes, and dyslipidemia. So when we examined the skin of the patients, the first symptoms reported were a little bit different than the symptoms that we found uh, when we made the first skin exam. So the first symptoms that were reported were uh, more commonly cysts or abscesses, uh, pain and tenderness, papules and pustules, skin irritation, and double-ended comedones. So these are kind of blackheads. By the time that patients were seen by dermatology, the cutaneous findings at presentation were a little bit different. So we still found that uh, very commonly they presented cysts and abscesses and papules and pustules, but about 50% of them already had scars by the time that they were seen by dermatology. They also had draining fistulas, that sometimes this is seen in more severe disease. And they also had ulcers that can be quite debilitating and um, 
affect quality of life uh, in any age, but uh, in pediatric age, this can also be a little bit more problematic. The most common symptom reported by patients during the first assessment was pain and tenderness. About 65% of them reported that their skin disease was painful. And other uh, signs and symptoms were drainage, um, bad odor, itchiness, and a minority had fever. In keeping with uh, what we know about HS, the most common sites affected were the folds and axilla was the most commonly affected site in children as well. Uh, inguinal folds, inner thighs, inframammary area, and perianal area were also reported uh, to be affected. When we um, try to determine how severe uh, hydrogen superativa is presenting in pediatric patients, unfortunately, we were not able to uh, gather this information in all 481 patients, but we had enough information in 288 pa patients to determine if they had mild, moderate, or severe disease. And we found that about almost 50% of patients presented with mild disease, but about 45% of them had moderate disease at presentation. And 8% had already severe disease when we were examining them for the first time. So what should we do with these patients? And, and sometimes this is a big dilemma because there's no uh, standardized clinical practice guidelines for the management of this disease. It is important to always um, discuss with the family and the patient uh, about the chronic nature of this disease. It's kind of recurrent uh, nature. Uh, it is important to always promote healthy lifestyle and weight control as this might contribute to uh, worsening or presentation of the disease. Uh, we need to rule out comorbidities. If we find that there are any metabolic or endocrine uh, abnormalities, we have to correct and manage this. And then we uh, need to address symptom management and consider medical treatment depending on symptoms and severity of disease. There have been lots of different comorbidities that are associated with HS. Children are more likely to have hormonal imbalances according to the literature. And earlier onset usually tells us that there might be more severe or widespread disease that might be associated with more comorbidities. When we looked at the comorbidities in the patients uh, of, in our study, we found that 84% presented other comorbidities. The most common comorbidity that we found was obesity, uh, followed by acne and um, patients being overweight. So weight issues were by far the most common uh, comorbidity that we found. In a subset of patients, in 388 of them, we were actually able to um, document height and weight. And um, we found that it was uh, interesting that about 20% of them actually also had normal weight. That uh, is important to know, and this might be a, a little bit of a different uh, population to characterize. When we kind of approach treatment for pediatric patients, we have many different treatment modalities. Unfortunately, this have not been well studied in children. Uh, currently, there is only one FDA-approved treatment for patients with HS that are 12 or older, and this is a biologic uh, called Humira. Um, most of the time when we see mild disease, we start with topical monotherapy. Um, patients that are a little bit more severe or that don't respond to topical treatment, we might consider systemic treatments like antibiotics or hormonal therapy, oral contraceptives. Uh, those that progress or don't respond to oral uh, systemic treatments, we might consider immunosuppressive systemic therapy. And there are many other modalities like oral or intralitional steroids, oral retinoids, surgery, uh, laser. Many things have been reported in the management of HS. Um, and many of this, uh, like I said, has not been well studied in children. And we lack uh, the information to know how effective these uh, treatment modalities are. When we looked at the treatment that had been used in the patients that we are reporting, uh, many different treatments had been used uh, and we were unable to draw 
uh, conclusions from the information that we gathered just because of the variety of topical and systemic treatments that had been used. Um, at the time that we collected our data, there was still no uh, approved uh, biologic to treat HS but we still found that about 4% of patients were already on biologics, even as an off-label uh, use of the medication. Um, and um, this definitely deserves further um, research because we still don't know what should be the standard of care and what our pediatric patients with this condition benefit the most from. We did notice that psychological support and nutritional support were only provided in a minority of patients. Um, and being obesity, the most common comorbidity, and being a pediatric age, a very important age for the de development of these patients, uh, both the psychological support to be able to deal with this disease and the nutritional support to be able to um, enhance some of the uh, um, interventions that would benefit these patients uh, are unfortunately not uh, used in a high number of patients. We did find that the most common complications were scars and retraction of the skin in the areas that were affected. Um, we also found psychological problems being uh, reported as complications of the disease, uh, restricted movement, fistulas, and obstructive uh, lymph drainage were also reported as complications in our patient cohort. Uh, we found that uh, about 22% of our patients had ER visits due to their disease. Hospitalizations were reported in about 8% of patients. And uh, when we looked at outcomes, only 14% reported what they would call resolution. 48% uh, uh, reported improvement with occasional flares about 32% reported persistence with occasional flares, and 5% uh, reported worsening despite treatment. So the takeaway messages from this presentation are that HS is often a diagnosis that is not recognized. So this should be in our radar. Children can present this uh, skin condition, um, and we should suspect it when we see kind of the clinical symptoms that we talked about. Remember, this is not an infection. Uh, children that have this condition should be screened to rule out comorbidities. We need to uh, put our efforts together um, to uh, complete other studies to determine the best treatments uh, for HS in children. And currently there's a lack of clinical practice guidelines, but there are a few efforts um, trying to put together uh, treatment recommendations for HS in pediatrics. So this work couldn't have been possible uh, without many, many different uh, collaborators. Definitely PIDRA was key for the um, coordination and um, being able to carry out this collaboration. Um, Abby was also key to provide funding for uh, for this research, and many different people uh, all over the world put um, their uh, efforts together and um, helped us uh, make this um, paper a reality. Thank you so much.